that's Alexandria. I live in Pope and uh, my specialty areas are horticulture. I work with our master gardeners, local foods and small farms. Hi, I'm Claire Lacan, and I am the local extension educator with Ag Food and Natural Resources serving Rice and Steel counties. And as you will be able to tell from today's presentation, I am a bug nerd and my interests are in insects and entomology in general, as well as soil health and cover crops. Go ahead, Shane. Right, and uh, my name is Shane Bougea. I'm a uh, extension educator in Blue Earth, Lesseur counties, and uh, soil health and insects, invasive species, native plants, a lot of interests. Um, I'm not a trained entomologist like Claire is, but uh, I think I get about uh, enough questions that I kind of get to have a little bit of a little bit of experience over time. So. Uh, again, we welcome you to our event, and we're going to really focus on identification today. Uh, we are happy to answer uh, some questions about management, but the, the focus we hope for today is going to be on identification. Let's see if I can get this to move. And uh, one of the things uh, is how important insects are to our daily life. And uh, one of the biggest things that we might see uh, reflected is pollination. Uh, insects and flowering plants have a long history together. There is a uh, artist rendition over there on the right of a uh, type of uh, tumbling beetle, which is the first confirmed pollinator by fossil evidence. Uh, and I'll show you another picture of its uh, real life counterpart next slide. But um, you know, over three fourths of our flowering plants rely on insects to some extent, uh, even some that, you know, uh, we may think are self pollinating. Sometimes there can be benefits for insects that pollinate them. Uh, one third of all of our food crops also are involve pollination from insects and just how many insects there are is incredible. We're talking about 40 to 50% of all complex life, million known species, probably much, much more than that. Insects are really special animals because a lot of times some, one can look very similar to the other, but be completely different genetically. Um, so we're really uh, just scratching the surface. And just so how few of those pests are insects in, in comparison to how many are out there. So this is the picture I kind of alluded to earlier. So this is the tumbling beetle that was uh, the 99 million year old uh, tumbling beetle. So this was hanging out when there were dinosaurs around and flowering plants were pretty new. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, scientists were able to figure out that this was a pollinator uh, based on the types of hairs that it had on its body. And it was in such a way that uh, these were specialized, uh, they, uh, scientists think, for pollination of, of flowers. And if you look closely, there's another insect that managed to get stuck in that amber uh, called a thrip. And you might see some thrip relatives on your plants today. So uh, I talked about pollination, but insects do quite a lot of other things that uh, benefit us humans, uh, one of which is serving as pest control, maybe to other insects, a lot of times to other insects, uh, but they're very important in, in that way in our gardens and uh, property. Uh, another kind of uh, thing that we may not think insects do a lot of, but they certainly do, is soil health, the movement of nutrients, uh, you know, um, decaying organisms, moving that into the soil, uh, allowing it to break down and to uh, nourish our plants, and then that will eventually nourish us. Uh, and then also the insects themselves serve as, serve as food for a lot of animals uh, and, and help contribute to biodiversity on our planet. And I, to I told you guys, I don't care where you are, you're going to have insects somewhere. Like I said, even Antarctica has a few. Uh, they've always been part of human culture all the different continents, uh, all the different history. People have made artwork using beetle wings. Uh, people have made products, people have made honey. Uh, emperors and kings have been uh, symbolized by them. So it's always important to, to figure out how can we identify these animals in our daily life. So let's start kind of from the beginning. What makes an insect an insect? Okay, and, and this is what we probably see at school, right? We see a stereotypical insect, usually a wasp, sometimes could be an ant in a way, um, and some, some depictions, but a lot of times we're gonna be focused on those six legs, 
It's got the three body segments, the head, thorax, abdomen. Uh, it's got the hard exoskeleton. Uh, so those bones are kind of on the outside of the body is kind of what we were told as school children. Uh, and a lot of times they'll have those two pairs of wings. So those are kind of the, uh, the kind of broad things that we learn in school. But when we go out into the garden or the yard, that may not be obvious to us. So look at all these different, these are all examples of insects. These are all insects. Some are at different life stages, some are adults, um, but you know, that doesn't really fit that wasp picture that we saw earlier. And then we could talk about wings too. A lot of these also, these are all insects here. That wing rule doesn't really make sense too. And I think some people were talking about crane flies earlier and there's one on the, the far right. Um, but we also have ones that we might see silverfish where wings are not obvious at all. And then some in ants where it's a little bit complicated about whether they have wings or not. Before we go any further, I just wanna say we're dealing with a type of organism that is so incredibly diverse on this planet that there's always going to be exceptions, including exceptions to the exceptions that I will be telling you today. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, these are, are helpful kind of things to get us uh, to put these animals in buckets. You know, we are humans, we like to put things in buckets and categories. Uh, and one of the things that we can do when we study insect identification is if we can at least narrow it down to a group of insects, uh, that makes it really useful for us when we're talking to professionals, whether that's master gardeners, whether that's pest control professionals, uh, and just narrowing down that list can be really helpful. The title of our presentation is at free insect ID. And uh, a lot of that is due to the limitations that some phone apps have. Um, you know, there's a lot of times the AI or the, the machine part of the identification tool works really great. Um, you know, oftentimes it can be a little confused about what's going on. Uh, maybe the camera you had wasn't working very well that day or the insect was flying a little too fast to get a good picture. Um, and then, not to mention Wi-Fi and, and other reception issues. So it's always good to have this knowledge in your back of your head so that when you go out there and you see these animals, um, you know, you'll have an idea of what they uh, can be. Is it a beneficial insect? Is it something that's more of a curiosity or kind of a fun thing to look at? At least if you're Claire and I, we find an insect that is really fun to look at, we probably would be in that camp. Uh, or is it a pest? And if it is a pest, um, that can be super important to finding appropriate control measures. Uh, and then oftentimes it can be helpful to see whether that's really the cause of the problem or more of a symptom. And a lot of times I think about carpenter ants and uh, trees. That's kind of an example where they might be a symptom uh, rather than a cause of the, the sick tree. So these are the common insect orders we'll focus on today. Uh, beetles, flies, wasps, ants, bees, butterflies, moths, true bugs, grasshopper katydids. Uh, you'll see the uh, Latin name of the uh, order. And when we talk about order, we're, we're talking about uh, taxonomic information. So if you guys had school, you, you might have learned the mnemonic kings play chess on fine grain sand. Uh, that kind of gives you an idea of, of the order that, that we talk about when we're looking at uh, at, at putting animals into buckets. And we're gonna focus on order today because the class is the insects. This is an insect focused topic, but we're gonna break it down into some of the common orders here. And this is Japanese beetle, by the way, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are huge fans of. Uh, I am not. <laughs> Other insect orders you might see in the garden, we don't have enough time to get into today. Uh, dragonflies, um, lace wings, uh, lace wings are great beneficial insects for your garden. Uh, and then there's thrips, which I kind of showed you in that fossilized amber. But again, these are really cool insect orders that you'll see, but we just, uh, there's so much diversity in, in insects that we just don't have time for them today. Then we have insects that kind of do lookalikes that might be confusing, that might make us think that they're insects. Uh, those would of course include spiders uh, and mites also. So things like ticks also would fall in that kind of category. Uh, anything with eight legs is kind of the rough identifier for that kind of group of animals. Uh, we have centipedes and millipedes, uh, crustaceans. So your pill bugs would not be considered insects. Uh, they would be a, a type of animal that's under that big 
umbrella. So yes, there's crustaceans that live on land. Uh, those little roly polies is what I used to call them when I was a little kid. Uh, but yeah, they would fall under that. Uh, and then springtails, Claire and I have been getting tons of calls about these guys last year. Um, those are not technically insects, at least not right now. Uh, sometimes there can be changes in taxonomy, but uh, they're not considered insects. So um, the things that we want to focus on today are let's try to break any type of insect identification down to these parts. Uh, what are its mouth parts? So you can see the ant over there has uh, some mandibles that are, might be used for chewing. Uh, the wing type, how that wing is arranged on the animal, what material it's made out of uh, can be super helpful. Uh, the antenna of the insect is also a good clue. Uh, and then there's other things like life cycle clues. So what we mean by that, <clears throat> and you can see those are box elder bugs over there, bottom right, another popular insect last year. So when we mean life cycle clues, so <clears throat> we're gonna take this stink bug here. This is a brown marmeted stink bug. You'll notice that some insects, when they're born, they're kind of like a baby version of the adult. Uh, we call that kind of a nymph. Uh, and over time, as they get older, they still keep that general shape. And a lot of times that could be called incomplete metamorphosis. On the other hand, when we look at things like caterpillars, uh, we look at things like wasps and, and bees, they might have something like this, where they have a larval form, it has a pupa, and then an adult. In that case, it's more of a complete metamorphosis, a complete life cycle. So there's big changes on this and this one in comparison to that incomplete one. We're going to start off with the most numerous of the insect orders, beetles. Uh, so this is a, a nice quote uh, by J.B.S. Haldane, who was a uh, is not Darwin. A lot of times you'll see things being quoted to Darwin, um, but his quote was talking about just how numerous beetles are in terms of species. They make the lion's share of insects. So that means they're about 40% of insects are a type of beetle. That translates to like 20 to 25% of most of the complex life we were talking about earlier. So if I was an alien being coming down to earth and I wanted to zip up a random animal, good chance that it would be a beetle. Um, to give you an idea of how many there are, so there's 6,000 lady beetle species uh, or ladybug species. That's about as the same number as all the mammals that we know on planet Earth. And that's just a tiny little sliver of, of beetle, uh, beetle order. And they're really adaptable. We have beetles that we find in the water, beetles that fly in the air, beetles that are hanging out in the soil. Uh, they're, uh, they're very successful out in nature. And one of the things I just absolutely love about beetles is just how tiny some of them can be and how massive some of those can be. So uh, the photo on the left, uh, this type of, of um, beetle is so tiny that a large amoeba would be an equal match. Uh, so that's just crazy to think about. And then on the right, we have a Hercules beetle, which is kind of on the other side of the spectrum. And uh, yes, the Hercules beetle can fly. So, <laughs> so it's one of those things where these are just uh, crazy diverse animals. So now we're going to get to the nitty gritty. We're going to talk about ID today. Again, we want to focus on that. I can nerd out all about beetles. Um, but one of the things that is going to be very helpful for me when I'm out in the field, uh, especially for the adults, is I'm going to be looking at the wings for beetles. Uh, beetles have, remember, all most in, or all the insects we're going to be talking about today have those two pairs of wings. For beetles, that forewing is going to be made of a leathery substance called an elytra, uh, and we'll show in the next slide that they meet very neatly down the middle. Uh, there's no overlap. There's no, uh, it's not arced in any way. Uh, you could almost take a, a knife and cut them right down the middle. On the larval stage, so these animals have um, a complete life cycle. So they have that kind of larva, pupa, uh, adult type uh, life strategy. A lot of times those um, larvae will be chewing mouth parts. Uh, they'll be, uh, sometimes they can cause damage at this stage. I can think of Japanese beetles as one of these types of animals that can cause damage at both the larval and the adult stage. 
Uh, antenna can be very variable. I wouldn't really focus too much on that to identify. Uh, and then, like I said, a lot of times the larva might be called a grub for a beetle. Um, and a lot of times you might see a softer body and uh, <clears throat> you might see these kind of legs um, uh, near the head. But uh, there are so many exceptions to the grub or larval stage of beetle. And uh, this is kind of going back to my favorite way of identifying adult beetles is looking at those wings, how neatly they meet up. So we have a soldier beetle on the left, a Japanese beetle, again, one of the favorite beetles in the garden, and then a ladybug on the right. They meet very neatly down the middle, no overlap, no tent, no structure. This is what I was saying when there's a lot of exceptions to the exceptions. So these are all beetle larvae. So you can see it doesn't necessarily meet the grub definition of a soft bodied animal with six legs. Uh, there are some, you know, we might see it on these middle ones here and the right one. By the way, and I'm gonna open up the chat here. Uh, does anybody recognize what the adult version of these beetles are? So it can be any of them. So you can type in the chat, what type of, what type of uh, beetle do you think that these are? Anyone recognize anything? Okay, yeah, I got some good some guesses. Some good guesses, in here. yep. Yeah. So yes, the one in the middle was a ladybug. The one on the left is actually, let me see if I can get this to reveal itself here, is a type of wood boring beetle, specifically emerald ash borer. So sometimes, again, the exceptions. Uh, we don't really find obvious legs. We don't even find a really good obvious head on some of those wood boring beetles. They kind of break the mold in that way. The one on the far right is a firefly larva. They really don't meet that soft bodied insect type thing. Uh, they really don't look like a grub. If I say the word grub to you, you probably have kind of like a big round thing, right? But again, when we're talking about insects, if they're incredibly diverse, beetles are incredibly diverse also. Um, <clears throat> so it's not really super easy on some of these life stages. Uh, that's why it's always important to kind of recognize, well, where did I find this animal on? What plant? Where did I find it on? So that might help you narrow it down um, a, a little. Uh, so <clears throat> another one that I find tricky uh, is weevils. So weevils are also a type of beetle. You, can, uh, you can't really see too well, but the wings meet neatly uh, down the middle uh, in the adult version. They do have chewing mouth parts as a adult. Sometimes it may look like they stick their beak into something uh, and suck out juices or something like that, but it's really more of the chewing type. Uh, their larvae look a lot like caterpillars. And again, there's no real easy answers. They don't really have super distinct legs as larvae, so that can help you a little bit. But just knowing what plants you're finding these animals on can go a long way for identifying, uh, identifying a beetle. I don't want to give you a bad taste in your mouth about all these beetles are all horrible. Uh, the ones that we really like uh, in our garden are ground beetles. Um, carabid beetles, you might hear Claire and I say, uh, these insects are great because not only do they eat uh, insect pests, they can occasionally also eat weed seeds or seeds that drop in from above. Uh, a lot of them have large mandibles that you can see even without a microscope or anything. Um, and they really do like those undisturbed covered areas. So a lot of times we tell people to go a little bit easier on the tillage when those when you're trying to enhance those animals in your uh, garden. They really like mulch and residue that breaks down. And often uh, if you have some place where there's plants growing all year round, like maybe a prairie, um, that might be really great for them when they overwinter, uh, just having areas for them to, to hide out in. Uh, the one in the bottom right there is a type of tiger beetle. A lot of times people think, oh, it's an emerald ash borer, it's an emerald ash borer, but no, it's, uh, it is a very beneficial insect uh, that we find in our gardens and, uh, and all over Minnesota. So now we're going to transition over to the flies. The fly is returning. So <clears throat> with the ones with flies, again, I, the, my favorite way to identify whether something is a fly is focusing on the wings. So very similar to beetles in the adult 
identification anyway. Flies are going to be interesting in that there are four wings. They're just going to have one obvious pair of wings that you'll see. You're not going to see two pairs of wings like you would with a beetle. If you look closely where their hind wings would be, there's these kind of knobby like structures near their right behind it called halteers. And we'll look a little bit more about that, but that's very important for that animal's flight. A lot of times uh, flies are great at flying, go figure. Uh, they can make uh, very precise turns and changes during flight. Those halteers really help them when they're out into the air. Uh, their mouth parts are also very variable compared to beetles. Um, and you'll show, I'll show a slide about that later. For antenna, you can maybe glean some things off of flies. Uh, usually they're on the smaller side, not always. Um, it can be difficult to see them. Um, so again, not 100% perfect way of identification, but sometimes if you put a couple things together, uh, it can help you narrow it down. Uh, and they have a complete life cycle. It's very similar to beetles in that we have kind of a larval stage, pupa, then uh, adult. And a lot of times we call the larval stage of a fly a type of maggot. And most often they don't have uh, distinctive, they don't have any types of distinctive legs that you see. They're basically a wiggling thing is the best way I can describe it. And a wiggly, wet, kind of gross thing in a way. But um, again, this is kind of reiterating some of the things to look for. So this is a, our crane fly um, where you can really see those halteers in the back. The one pair of wings is going to be absolutely critical for these animals. Um, for uh, identifying animals. You'll see a lot of things, and Claire will show this, you'll see a lot of flies try to masquerade as other types of insects. The one thing that will give them away is those wings. And then uh, the smaller antenna, again, not always. Um, I would say the crane, the crane fly over here has a little bit longer antenna as opposed to something like a house fly. Uh, or uh, types of flies you might find on your your uh, your crops. So it's not a perfect thing, but uh, sometimes if you can combine those two, it can be helpful. Talked about how different mouth parts there are. Uh, flies are really cool in that way. Um, there's a lot of different ways that, that they've evolved uh, to gather food. Uh, we kind of think of the house fly type thing. We might see it in cartoons or movies where the fly is, is regurgitating a little bit of digestive juices and kind of sopping up things. That would be more like the sponging type of mouth part. Then we have the, um, that's an insect, but a lot of people call it the state bird of Minnesota. The mosquito would fall under that piercing sucking uh, category where it's actually going into your skin and sucking the juices out of you. Uh, that would fall under that piercing sucking uh, mouth part type style. Then we have something that's a little bit more nuanced called siphoning. Uh, it's more like a straw rather than something that is like a syringe. Um, and a lot of times you'll see that with, with flies that have a lot of nectar. Um, that's where they get their food. A lot of times you'll see those types of mouth parts. In the garden, a lot of times when we're looking at, is this a, what type of insect this is? What type of damage? Most often, uh, you're going to see damage due to the larval form of the fly. So not necessarily the adult fly, but the larval form. So these are some uh, a, a kind of examples of what you might see in the garden. So we have cabbage maggots, we have onion maggots, we have spotted wing drosophila, which is a huge pest in Minnesota with a lot of different fruits. Uh, again, they really kind of like moist areas, decomposing areas, that's kind of where they tend to have fun. Um, their mouth parts in this larval stage are a little complicated. Some have more of a hook. Uh, some are more like mandibles, uh, but you know that's still that general body shape, the lack of legs, the lack of head, um, that can narrow it down for you when you're looking at uh, what type of damage something is. Again, we don't want you to run away and say, this is horrible, all these things are horrible, let's get rid of all of these flies. Uh, there are a lot of great flies that are doing work in your garden and yard. Uh, some of the ones that I see a lot of, uh, the robber fly, it's a really uh, predatory type of fly. And if you look closely, you can kind of peek out, you can see the halteer of the fly over here. Um, and then the one pair of wings is kind of folded. Uh, but 
Uh, these are predatory insects, and a lot of times they catch their prey in flight, in the air. Uh, so it really is an advantage to be a fly because you have that extra control. Uh, the one in the middle is a surfeit fly. This would be like your hover flies. You might find, uh, you know, that have that kind of black and yellow banding. Um, they're very great at eating aphids. Uh, and then uh, last but certainly not least, the ones that come to mind anyway, the tachinid flies. So these are a type of parasitoid where uh, a parasitoid is an animal that requires, it's kind of like a parasite, except that when it completes its life stage, it kills the host. A lot of times a parasite will just live off a host. If you're a parasitoid, you kill the host when you're done. Uh, and tachinid flies, uh, and you'll learn later some wasps as well, have this type of, of life cycle. Uh, so you'll see that there's some eggs that are on top of this <clears throat> caterpillar. Uh, and one of the, it's very, it's not necessarily the easiest to identify these guys, the tachinid flies, but a lot of times people will say, look at the really long hairs on the animals. They're usually stiff uh, and long. And that could be kind of a hint sometimes, but if you see eggs on any type of pest caterpillar, um, it's wise to leave that be because those are beneficial insects to your garden. This is just a cool thing that you might see right now. Um, so there are insects that are active in the winter time. One of them is winter midges and they're a type of fly. They can be active uh, to minus four degrees, I believe, or at least be moving around, uh, but they are active in the winter time. And a lot of times fish are very attracted to them as a food source. Um, there's some really good research that's being done at the University of Minnesota that looks at these animals, the Chironomidae uh, research group. So that's the kind of group of insects that these belong to. So just something cool that, you know, again, insects are very diverse and they'll find a way to survive in an environment if you give them a chance. So now I think I'm going to have Claire get ready um, with her slides. And I don't know how ready you are, Claire. I think you're probably ready to go. Yep, I am. Okay. And I just posted this here too, because this is another type of fly that you're going to see um, is that pine cone midge in the willows. So hopefully when spring comes, uh, that's kind of the transition slide there. So take it away, Claire. All right. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. All right. So Shane just touched on flies and their distinguishing traits. So with those things in mind, can you tell me which of these is the fly here? You can put this in the chat. So A, B, C, a combination. Let's see, lots of Bs coming in. Great, yes. So you are right, B is a fly. And you can tell with those uh, big eyes here and maybe some of the other traits. But before I get ahead of myself, myself um, I, it was a trick question because actually A is a fly as well. And it is a bumblebee mimic fly. So it makes sense why you thought it was a bee. And it's actually a kind of robber fly. And then we also have a bumblebee, a true bumblebee, the tricolored bumblebee is C here. So let's look at the traits. Uh, come on, behave. There we go. So like Shane mentioned, flies have those short antennae, and that's one way you can see that they're different from the bumblebee here. The antennae are longer than the head on this bumblebee. Another thing is looking at their eyes. So fly eyes will often take up a majority of their head. And that can be a little tricky, and I know you're probably thinking, how am I going to look at eyes? But you will get used to kind of just seeing that the eye takes up the main portion of the head for a fly. It can be tricky because some bees, especially drones, so the male of some social bees, can have big eyes that take up a large portion of their head too. But that's one thing. If you notice big eyes, there's a good chance, especially if you see the antennae are really small compared to those big eyes, that's something that can help you uh, know that you're looking at a fly rather than a bee. And then as Shane said, flies have two wings, so one pair of wings, where bees have four wings, two pairs. And 
that's something that you really might notice more when they're flying. It is difficult to see those different pairs of wings because they kind of fold them in when they're stationary like this. So you've probably guessed the next group we're going to talk about is our group that contains bees, ants, and wasps. And this group of insects is really well known for their interesting behaviors and abilities, like an ant's capability to carry many times its body weight. Uh, they're really interesting social structures of essentially functioning like one organism when they live in a colony and more. And, and this group of insects, unlike some of the others, I'd say, is pretty familiar in our day-to-day -day language, so much so that they've made their way into pop culture, like these comic book superheroes here. And when we're looking at traits in this order, we want to look at the wings, as we mentioned, so the number of wings. And again, I know it can be difficult to see those wings on a moving insect, um, but if you do happen to see four versus two wings, that is a good, you know, a good indicator if you do see that trait. So those wings there, um, their mouth parts in this order can be somewhat variable, but we're often looking at chewing or a combination of those chewing and lapping mouth parts. And the antenna are something that varies within this order, but again, what distinguishes this order from flies or some other orders is that the antenna is longer than the head. And in some of our groups within this order, we see the bend, kind of the elbowed antenna is what we call it. We see that in ants especially, or an antenna that has that kind of right angle, the bend to it. And insects in this order do go through complete metamorphosis. Uh, and there's a lot of variation though within this group of what their young look like. So an ant larva looks way different than a sawfly larva, for example. And we'll kind of look at some examples of that. But looking at the larva is really not the best clue in distinguishing this order from other orders because there's a lot of kind of crossover and look alike but it might help you know what you're dealing with within the order. If you've narrowed it down to this group of ants, wasps, and bees, and sawflies, then you, uh, the larva are looking at the immature might help you have a clue of what you're looking at. And another trademark of this order is a small skinny waist. Uh, so the constriction between the thorax, which is the middle part of the body, and the abdomen, which is the end. So this kind of hourglass figure or the waist coming into a constriction, um, that's something that differentiates it, particularly from flies that have a body that the middle and end section are basically parallel and don't have that part that gets skinny and comes in. And you might not notice it on some of our like bumblebees, but if you do notice the really skinny waist, that's a really great indicator that you're looking at something in this group, a wasp, ant, or bee. And you think of the mud dauber. This is a picture I have here is a blue mud dauber. And it has a really elongated skinny waist. So that's very exaggerated. And that's what would tell you, yes, this is a wasp. This is in the, the group of insects of wasp, bees, and ants. And I just want to point out that this photo here is a, a murder hornet, a so-called murder hornet, an Asian giant hornet. And sometimes people call us thinking that they have seen this insect. We have not yet found it in Minnesota. And so often what people end up showing us is a cicada killer wasp, which is also very large. Um, and has that constricted waist, but actually looks pretty different from a murder hornet if you look at the coloration and some of the traits of the body. So these are often our long sidewalks and driveways in individual holes. Uh, so again, in all likelihood, if you see a large wasp, you're probably looking at the cicada killer wasp, not a murder hornet. And I touched on the mouth parts a little bit. This is just a close up that many insects in this group have these chewing mouth parts, those mandibles. 
And uh, as I'm sure you're familiar, many dr bees drink nectar. And so they use this lapping kind of tongue structure to eat the nectar. We often get asked how to di differentiate a bee from a wasp. And telling the difference is especially important if you find a colony in your yard or in your garden or even in or on your house and are hoping that a beekeeper might remove it for you. Because really a beekeeper is only interested if it's a honeybee colony. So it's important to know if you're dealing with honeybees or actually wasps in that case. So bees tend to have more fur or these hair-like structures on their body, particularly on the middle section of their body, also on their legs. Bees are specialized for pollination. And so those hairs help or that fur helps collect pollen. Bees tend to be vegetarian in that they're after pollen and nectar on flower sources. They're again, efficient pollinators because not only do they have those hairs in many cases, they have some other specialized structures, particularly meant for gathering pollen. And then bees, of course, we know with our honeybee, which is pictured here, some produce honey. Uh, wasps, on the other hand, tend to be much less hairy. You may see some of those hair-like structures, but generally not fuzzy like bees. Many of them have a stage of their life where they're predatory or after kind of meat protein sources. Um, it kind of depends on the time of year. Sometimes they're really after sugar sources, carbohydrate sources. In general, wasps are not great pollinators. They're more incidental pollinators, just kind of accidentally spreading pollen as they go, but not specialized for moving that pollen like many bees are. And again, between these two, a wasp is going to have a more exaggerated skinny waist than most of our bees. And it will be more obvious because of their lack of hair. So you can kind of see that in this picture here. You see the hourglass shape. You see that actually it looks like on the top here, the thorax and abdomen don't even touch where you don't see that exaggerated constriction on the honeybee. Ants are also in this group. And one thing that really distinguishes them from wasps, or I th I'd say sometimes you might mix up an ant and a wasp, but it's this node here. It's the section on their constricted waist that is a, a node or called a petiole. And, um, the presence of that can help you determine that you're dealing with an ant. They also have that elbowed or bent antenna and they are social. And so it can be tricky because there are some life forms where they have wings. And so they can look like some other critters. I'll just touch on that in a second here, um, but our reproductive forms. So things that are going to turn into queens in general, can have wings where the typical worker ant doesn't have wings. So looking at some of those clues, what do you guys think? Is this a wasp or a winged ant? You can put that in the chat. Wasp is coming in and yes, I think you guys got it because we are not seeing that node on the constricted waist. So good job, that is a wasp. And now what about this one? You can put this in the chat as well. Is this an ant or a wasp? Nice. Many of you are saying it's an ant and you've got it because it has two nodes in the middle here. And so it is a winged life form of the ant, but it is indeed an ant. And you can tell because of those uh, nodes. And typically when we're, <laughs> when we're at the point where we're willing to look at nodes on our insects, we probably are concerned that it might be an issue or might be a pest issue. And in extension, we're pretty used to 
uh, people bringing in ants to the office and wondering if they're carpenter ants or termites, right? They're usually worried that it's it's a problem. And so I just wanted to give you a few tricks for distinguishing if something is a carpenter ant. Uh, so carpenter ants will have one node between their middle and end body parts. So that one petiole or node uh, where a lot of other ants that might have that winged life form too often have two nodes. So that's one clue to look for. The way to differentiate a carpenter ant from a termite would be that constricted waist, the presence of the node then on that constricted waist because termites have a straight kind of broad waist similar to like the flies that we showed you. And then um, you can also look at the wings where carpenter ants have their top and bottom wings are different sizes and termites have their wings uh, as equal lengths. So those are just some clues. Uh, but again, like Shane mentioned, carpenter ants are usually or often a symptom of a problem rather than really the root cause of a problem. But they're not great to find in your house. Um, and so you would want to know if you're dealing with carpenter ants or termites. But I will say too, very, very rarely will we find termites in Minnesota. Pretty unusual. Often, if you're seeing some sawdust type, you know, mess in your house or something like that, and also seeing these creatures, you're dealing with a carpenter ant. Uh, yeah, rather than a termite. So wrapping up our ID of that order of the wasps, ants, and bees, can you tell me what is wrong with this social media post here? You can put this in the chat too. Yep, it's not a bee, it's a fly. And that is correct. And some of the things you're looking at here to help you differentiate is the one pair of wings. You can pretty much see that there's not that second pair that's going lower than that top wing. The short antenna and the mouth part is just not correct. I guess it's more likely to be the mouth part of a fly uh, because it's that uh, long mouth part there, but you won't see a bee that has kind of that spear. Sometimes we see that in cartoons, I guess, kind of like the stinger. Uh, another thing is that it doesn't have a constricted waist. It's very clearly one size throughout the body. Uh, but funnily enough, they did get the number of wings correct on the necklace they're selling here. Just not in their image. So next we're going to talk about butterflies and moths. And with this group more than others, I'd say, we often have completely different names for the immatures and the adults. So we call the larvae, the immature stage, caterpillars, but we also have totally different names for the same species. So for example, this is a tomato hornworm. And in the adult form, we know it as a hawk moth. And this is a woolly bear caterpillar. And in the adult form, we know it as a tiger moth. So we even turn bears into tigers in this group and caterpillars in their adult forms. So uh, the moths and butterflies do obviously look and behave very differently. So that's probably a reason that different names have developed. And we often consider some of these caterpillars pests in our yards and gardens where, so the immature stage is their hungry stage where they're feeding the most where they generally do the most damage. And we often don't mind the adults or even admire the beauty of the adults in many cases um, because they're just usually eating nectar. So they don't bother us like their hungry caterpillars do. And just a note here, we're full of little mnemonics around here, Shane and I. So uh, this is a note on how to distinguish between a tomato hornworm, which is pictured here, and a tobacco hornworm, which look really similar and both feed on tomatoes. But you look at these white markings here and a tomato hornworm will have eight Vs, 
And so you think V8 tomato juice is tomato hornworm and a tobacco hornworm would have seven just dashes like diagonal lines. So you can think of seven lucky stripes like lucky strike cigarettes, which is tobacco hornworm. So just a little fun mnemonic to help you remember the difference, but both of them will be pests occasionally on tomato plants. As far as traits that differentiate this group from other insects, they're pretty unique in having these scaled wings. And so you know when you touch a moth or butterfly and get that powdery stuff on your fingers, those are actually tiny scales from their wings. And so that's what we're talking about when we say scaly wing is that powdery stuff. And of course, when they're caterpillars, we know they have those chewing mouth parts that are good at eating our plants. And as adults, they have siphoning mouth parts. Uh, you probably know it as a proboscis or learned that in school. And that's for drinking liquids like nectar. And then their antenna can be really variable from super feathery to long and skinny with a knob at the end. Um, but so you, you may help, that, that trait may help you differentiate between species within this group, but, um, and maybe from some other groups as well in, in that you have the feathery uh, antennae that kind of set it apart from some other insects. And, and Shane hinted at this earlier when talking about weevils, but there are some other larvae or immatures that can be confused with caterpillars. So in the chat, can you tell me which one left or right you think is a true caterpillar? Couple of both of each, right, left. This is a tough one. So I will give you the clues that you're looking for here, but it is this one. This is a caterpillar. The other picture was of some sawfly larvae. And the things you're looking at uh, with caterpillars, you have uh, along with the six true legs up at the front up toward the head. You have five or fewer pairs of pro legs, which are these legs that are further down on the body, closer to the rear end. Um, so if you see five or fewer of these sets of legs, then uh, you're likely looking at a caterpillar. And with sawflies, you can see in this picture, you have usually more than five pairs of these pro legs. So they both have these six true legs toward their head, but then further down their body, we're looking at more legs on sawfly larvae than we see on caterpillars. And it is important to know the difference because uh, BT insecticide would work on caterpillars, on our caterpillar pests, but would not be effective on sawfly larvae because it's a totally different group of insects. They are actually in the wasp ant and bee group. They're closely related to wasps, sawflies flies are. So just another look at this here, you see the six true legs on both critters, but then you see many more of these pro legs on the sawfly larvae than you do on the caterpillar. And we're going into our true bugs here. And this winter, there's probably only one, maybe two true bugs that are on your mind. A box elder bugs are probably in your house this year. Sounds like most people have a few visitors in their house this year. And maybe some stink bugs, particularly brown marmorated stink bugs. Uh, but true bugs are common in the yard and garden. So we've got Anything, we've got a, a huge variety often that we see in the, the garden or in our yards. Anything from tiny little aphids all the way to big cicadas. We have ambush bugs. This is a brown marmorated stink bug, the beloved box elder bug, an emerging cicada, dog day cicada, uh, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers. Uh, uh, this is a Western conifer seed bug white flies 
and some of uh, this is a tarnished plant bug. So we've got some that we maybe find interesting, some that are beneficial, and some often that are pests. I do want to touch on um, somebody had a question about the spined soldier bug uh, being a stink bug. And I will, I just want to grab your attention that I will talk about that in a couple slides here. But yes, the spine soldier bug is in that same group uh, as stink bugs. So when we are looking at true bugs, some of our more common true bugs, I'd say that kind of look like box elder bugs or that are often mistaken for beetles. So that happens more than you might think. And the main trait that can help you differentiate between a true bug and a beetle is the wings. So like Shane mentioned, the wings on a beetle will meet down the center and uh, have a straight line where the wings on a true bug will overlap. So like this wing is under this wing. They'll also tend to be more leathery than most of our beetles instead of having that hardened uh, kind of wing shell or elytra. It's more leathery. And they often have this thickened leathery wing portion on the uh, toward the top of the wing and more membranous on the bottom of the wing. Another thing is that this big triangle section tends to be pretty large on true bugs where on beetles. It's usually small and also points down that middle line of their wings, where here you see the triangle meets another triangle. Uh, in our true bug group, the mouth parts are those piercing sucking mouth parts. So that differentiates it from other orders for sure. Um, and that's why they are good at eating our plants and eating other insects because they have those piercing sucking mouth parts. The antenna are uh, not uh, uniform across this group, but it can help you identify within this group. Um, so like for brown marmorated stink bug, their antenna have stripes. And so that's one clue you can look at to differentiate it from other stink bugs. And for their life cycle clues, they are incomplete as far as their life cycle. It's an incomplete metamorphosis. So they're young, their immatures are called nymphs, and they look generally pretty similar to the adults. Uh, another thing that I want to point out with this group compared to other groups is that uh, context clues can be really important here. So you might see something like this picture here probably looks to you like it's immature box elder bugs. But if we use the host plant looking at the plant that they're on, we see it's milkweed. And these are in fact nymphs or immatures of large milkweed bugs. So uh, looking at the plant and the context can be really helpful within this group. Oh, and this is just a picture of that piercing sucking mouth part. You can see on this cicada here, which is a plant eater, it's a really long, skinny piercing sucking mouth part. But not all true bugs are plant eaters. Uh, they're not even, all stink bugs are not bad. So here are some predaceous or kind of beneficial uh, insects in the true bug group here. So we have our ambush bugs. So they have specialized arms at the front that grab their prey, kind of like a praying mantis. Uh, we have a stink bug here that's eating a potato, uh, an immature larva of a Colorado potato beetle. We have a minute pirate bug eating an aphid. And this is actually an immature of the spined soldier bug eating a caterpillar pest. So yes, uh, spined soldier bugs are in the same group of stink bugs, but they tend to be predatory. And one way you can tell the plant eaters from our predatory or um, you know other insect eating true bugs is to look at their mouth part. So that piercing sucking mouth part or their beak, if you want to call it that, um, and plant eaters here is a really long, skinny mouth part. Think about it, all it has to pierce through is leaf tissue to get to the juices inside the leaf. And um, sometimes 
the plant tissue can be deep or right long, uh, far away to get to. And then the predatory, uh, this is a stink bug, the predatory true bugs uh, tend to have a short, stouter or thicker beak that can pierce through the exoskeleton of other insects. So we think of the plant eaters being long and skinny and the predatory insects being having that short, stout beak. With that in mind, is this a plant eater or a predatory true bug? Let's see what you think. Predatory, good job, yes. It has that thick beak that's pretty short. And this is a masked hunter, which is a really good predator of a variety of insects. So you're honing in on how short and thick that beak is. And just an interesting note here that uh, it's called a masked hunter because the young covers itself in dust and debris and dirt uh, to camouflage itself and sneak up on prey. Okay, this is our last order here. This is our orthopteran group, and I tried really hard, Shane and I both tried really hard to minimize the insect jargon and not throw too many scientific names at you, but there's just really not a good common name for this group of insects that overarchingly describes the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets. So you may hear me say orthopteran, it's the orthoptera order, but this is our grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets. That's what we have in North America. Also in this group is an insect, a group of insect called Weta, which are present in New Zealand and can be very large, the size of mice actually. Uh, the giant Weta is what I'm holding here. But in general in North America, this is our grasshoppers, katydids and crickets. Some, I, I, I think many of you probably can recognize a grasshopper or a cricket, uh, but the things that you look at and that might help you differentiate within the group too um, would be the antenna for help you differentiate within the group. The wings of this whole order are leathery. The mouth parts across the board are generally chewing. So those mandibles that are really good at chewing our plants. Uh, and then the antenna can help you differentiate between grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids, for example. So grasshoppers tend to have, yes, pretty long skinny antenna, but not as long as katydids or crickets, which I'll show you in a second here. Their life cycle is that incomplete metamorphosis. So their young, their immatures tend to look similar to the adults. I sometimes think they're funny because their heads look a little too big for their bodies, but generally the nymph, the immature, looks like a miniature adult. So katydids can be nicknamed longhorned grasshoppers. Their antennae are very long, if you can see in these pictures here, often um, almost as long as their already pretty long bodies. We have all these different groups of katydids in Minnesota, believe it or not. Um, but even though they're kind of nicknamed longhorned grasshoppers, Katydids are more closely related to crickets. Here's two pretty common grasshopper species that we have in Minnesota, the differential grasshopper and the two-striped grasshopper. They'd be managed pretty similarly. There's not a, a lot of benefit of knowing what species of grasshopper you have as far as management goes, but just for your own interest, uh, these are kind of two of our main species. Crickets have those long antenna as well. So that's one reason you can think of them as being closely related to katydids. Uh, their antenna tend to be as long as their body or longer. We would often encounter field crickets in Minnesota. Uh, these are commonly found in fields, pastures, roadsides, in your yards where they feed on a variety of plants, but also dead and weakened insects and also kind of decaying matter or plant debris. So. That's a little bit different than our katydids and grasshoppers that are gonna eat more just plant material. Our crickets will be sort of on that 
decomposer side a little bit. And indoors, they can feed on fabric like cotton and wool. Um, but uh, you may or may not be familiar with this cricket here. This is a camel cricket, and they're often found in cool, damp, and dark areas. So you may notice them less than field crickets. Um, and outdoors, they're often under like logs and stones and feed on plant debris as well, kind of that decomposer. And I just want to touch on locusts and make it clear that they're in this group of insects. They're in the order Orthoptera. Uh, actually, locusts are a kind of grasshopper, but not all grasshoppers are locusts. So they're in that same family as grasshoppers. Uh, and sometimes people hear that really loud droning in late summer and say, oh, there's the locusts. But actually what you're hearing that time of year, that's cicadas in the trees which like we talked about are true bugs. So please, if you call cicadas locusts, please know that's not the case. And actually locusts are a kind of grasshopper. And it's actually pretty fascinating. They, um, they basically have the potential, they're sometimes thought of as like a migratory grasshopper because they can swarm, right? When we hear of swarms of locusts, this is kind of, this is the, insect that we're talking about and and they basically have the potential to behave and look totally different depending on whether they're solitary or if it, they're in a group of others of their same species and so unlike drought years when resources are scarce they tend to be at higher populations or more likely to be in a group and it's this whole big thing uh, that has to do with some serotonin and hormones and everything. But if you see this picture here, if they are solitary and not in a group, they basically act like a normal grasshopper. They look like this, right? And then this is the same species, but reared in a group, they look and act totally different. This form here is when locusts, um, end up being in a swarm or being in that what scientists call a gregarious phase where they swarm and can do major damage in a group, uh, basically decimating crops in some cases. And so I could, I in preparation for this presentation, I read up on these and I could do a whole presentation just about locusts, but the main thing is they are a kind of grasshopper. They are not cicadas. And that is wrapping things up. We just want to share our final thoughts again on why basic insect ID matters. It's an important step in figuring out how you're going to manage these insects. Knowing what you're dealing with helps you know what to do about them. It helps you understand what you have going on in your yard and garden. Like Shane mentioned, it helps you communicate with other hort and egg professionals. And the best part about some of these easy ID tricks is that you don't need internet connection, you don't need to pull out your phone, and you don't need Wi-Fi to find out what insect you're dealing with. And with that, we'll take some questions. Yeah, uh, so Claire, we have a question about a biting water bug in ponds in northern Minnesota. And I'm kind of familiar with the giant kind of toe biter one that you might hear about. And I don't know, Troy, you might be the best one actually. Have you seen any other uh, types of uh, true bugs in an aquatic system? In my case, I have not. Um, and I actually apologize. Uh, I perhaps haven't taken close enough note from folks uh, related to that when they bring these species in to me uh, um, historically. So uh, I'm sorry about that, Shane. It's fine. Yeah, there's. I don't know. There's a couple. Uh, there's a couple resources I know uh, that talk about the giant water bug, which I think you know might be what I think of when I think of. Uh, Kind of a biting water bug and i'll post that in there Got a good right yep, that's yeah the that's main a good one i would, I would be i would be shocked if that was just one type but again because we there might be things we really just yeah that's kind of a tricky question 
there are other water bugs, but I, right. I think the main biting one. Yeah. 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 Right. And Claire and Shane, there's a fantastic question here. Um, it comes from one of our master gardeners here in St. Louis County on what sort of resources uh, uh, would you recommend in relationship to field guides or other types of uh, uh, guides to have with you when you're out besides, of course, the um, app sort of approach? So one that I like that is pretty user friendly and isn't overly scientific um, is the National Audubon Society field guide for insects and spiders. Oh. I will uh, send this in it. our resource page. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting yeah. it correctly in the screen there, but it's the National Audubon Society Field Guide to Insects and Spiders. It's pretty small and has a lot of pictures in it, which I appreciate. And I think I like it as a starting spot because it's not overly technical or scientific. Yeah, I, you know, that's a good question too. Uh, we have some resources too that I, that I have that are more specific to, because a lot of the calls that I get at the office are related to crops, right? So I have a lot of books that kind of identify certain pests uh, even kind of ones like hops. So you get kind of different guides, kind of scouting guides. Um, but yeah, anything that Claire has, uh, th that that resource, the Audubon Society is great. Um, Brianna also recommends Insects of the North Woods. I think I've heard of that resource mm -hmm. as well. And um, this is not a field guide. Yeah. Because it's a really yep, big, a big book. Mm -hmm. But what I love is it's full of pictures. Right. And it's really laid out very well and it gives immature. So if you're a bug nerd and you can tell I am too, even though I'm not trained as a bug nerd, I'm definitely not trained in using this camera, right? Um, this is a great book just to have in your library. So it's by Whitney Crenshaw's Garden Insects of North America. But those small guides, like you said, the, the Ottoman, not Ottoman, whatever it was, the guides, the little pocket books, the yep. field guides are good too. And the one from the North Woods that Jeff Hahn wrote mm -hmm. several years ago is a very good guide. Vinegaroons. Vinegaroons, are they grasshopper species or are they scorpions? Well, They're what, what a kind are they, of, they are kind of whip scorpion, vinegaroons. Uh, um, yep. And, so. and I, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if they get, is it a defensive mechanism that they, they put out with that smells like vinegar? I don't remember why they call them vinegar runes. Oh, I remember. I think I guess um, I think it's vinegar rune. I oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought it was... I don't think I'm, I don't know though. I am not super familiar with this group, and I'm glad that I don't encounter them often. <laughs> but my love for insects does not always extend to a love for arachnids. Oh, okay. Yeah, they yeah. do look like they excrete an acetic acid. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there is some vinegar relationships. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, what else? Diatomaceous. Oh, I see. Is diatomaceous earth the best organic non-harmful approach to reduce crickets? That is an interesting question. Usually we use the diatomaceous earth to go for the soft-bodied insects, um, the slugs, the caterpillars, things like that, because diatomaceous earth is very sharp. And when those bugs crawl across it, it rips them up. I don't think that I have never heard them used for more hard bodied you, insects. Like you can, yeah, there are uses for diatomaceous earth on harder bodied insects. And I think the exact method, how it controls those animals. I've heard a couple different theories, Claire about how it affects hard-bodied insects with that material. Um, you know, I don't know. I've had some you, you luck with them on some insects and none on others. So again, I, something to, to experiment with. I don't um, know what the research is on yeah, the Yeah, I think we would have to dive into that a little insect. deeper. Yeah. I have had success in some situations and none in others. So it's kind of one of those things where probably more research is needed and, and probably how I applied it mattered. As a follow-up, as a follow-up to that, um, 
Could you uh, also go into the aspects or differences between food grade versus mm -hmm. just pool diatomaceous earth? Yeah, I am just, I, I, I don't want to give an answer that I'm not super duper confident on. I think what feels we feels like do you might be able to touch on that, Troy. A little or... bit. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe Troy, I, I mean, we can, we can answer this after uh, the event. I think we'll probably be able to, to, to get some research to dig into take a look it. At yeah. that. I don't want to give you an answer that um, I don't Same. feel confident in. Uh, what attacks apple trees? Oh, probably Lots. everything. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, there are apple lots of different it. insects. Yeah, uh, different apple insect coddling. orders. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to list them, but you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if we're going back to our presentation, there are a lot of insect orders that attack our apple trees, right? Yes. So diptera, those, those you know, maggots. Flies. Yep. Flies, yeah. Um, weevil, there's plum cucurl. Plum right? curculio is weevil. a weevil. Mm -hmm. uh, Japanese beetles, of course, mm -hmm. will eat apple tree leaves. Certain stink bugs can cause damage that is kind of cosmetic, depending on how early it hits. And um, then you moth those... is one that we monitor for. Um, what was that? Butterfly. What was that? Yellow jackets in the fall. Yeah, there are some animals that can, especially if they, the fruit is wounded, uh, there's going to be some insects that really enjoy going into those areas. Uh, yellow jackets particularly enjoy it if it's dead fall or fallen on the ground and wounded. Japanese beetles can also get into fruit, some types of fruits. I usually see it on plums um, because, you know, that's one of their favorite foods. But if there's any type of split or crack, sometimes you can find you Japanese beetles eating that material rather than usually on the leaves. Yeah, but a lot of things tap, attack apple trees. And we have some good resources on our extension website about all the different types of critters that can cause issues. Um, one of the things we talk about in extension is how intensive, labor intensive, you know, if you really are going 100%, I want to have a clean 100% no nothing apple. It's an intensive plant uh, to keep in that uh, pristine state, I would say. Whether you're organic well or put. not. <laughs> All right. Difference between Good. gypsy moth larva and tent caterpillars webworms and their control. They all seem to live in large populations. Gypsy moth larvae were very destructive last year and seem to eat every plant, including conifers, garden plants, deciduous trees. That I believe, especially the trees. Uh, gypsy moths are incredibly damaging invasive insect uh, to Minnesota. Um, a lot of times they're treated on a large scale with BT applications aerially. Um, if, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, That's correct. Yep. That seems to be the main way that they're tackled. Uh, and BT is a, is a type of insecticide that's derived from bacteria uh, that can affect a lot of different insect orders, but it depends on the strain. Um, and in this case, it's kind of what we think of when we think of BT. Um, I guess then, a way to tell them apart from the right. tent caterpillars would be like gypsy moths, um, which actually may have a name change to spongy moth, I've heard. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, have a spongy kind of egg mass. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that you might look for, see with gypsy moths. Um, and then with tent caterpillars, you that's where you have the webbing in trees, where you have the tent. Uh, so that's how to differentiate them. But the same strain of BT that would work on gypsy moths would work on mm -hmm. um, tent caterpillars as mm -hmm. well. And then there would be some other pesticides that you could use in your yard or garden to tackle um, tent caterpillars also. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is a question about plants that attract beneficial insects. And that's a thing this question. You, you talk about beneficial insects. So yes. a lot of people think all bugs are bad, but no, there are a lot of good bugs out there. And that's why mm -hmm. it's so important to know the bug. Yeah, they might be creepy crawly. You might not like the looks of them, but you've got uh, ladybugs, lacewings, parasitic wasps, those ground beetles, dragonflies, praying mantises, there are beneficial nematodes, even lightning bugs, their larvae can be beneficial insects. And so there are plants you can include in your garden that will attract those beneficials to your insect. One of the easiest ones to get 
either at the garden center or in um, <laughs> by seed is to plant alyssum. Alyssum is that little tiny low ground cover that's it's generally white, sometimes it's purple. There's gold alyssum as well. And that attracts the beneficials that eat aphids. And so we grow golden alyssum in, in baskets in our greenhouse to detract, to, to keep the aphids away. But you can always also grow coriander. Coriander is a, an herb that will attract beneficials. A lot of these also attract butterflies, cosmos, dill, fennel, Yep. Lemon gem marigold, that's a small French marigold. Marigolds have an oil in it that will detract some, not only in, that will attract some insects and um, will shoo away like rabbits and stuff because they don't like to eat them. Sedum, spearmint, yarrow, and zinnia. Yeah. They're all plants that are, um, a lot of them are annuals. The perennials are easy to start from seed and they are very perennial in Minnesota, perhaps a little bit invasive, but they will, they, those are the plants that will attract some of those beneficial insects. And, and Robin listed a lot of plants that have a similarity in terms of their flowers. When we look at beneficial insects, a lot of the animals that we want to attract to our landscape uh, tend to have, um, their tongues are not super long for a lot of the wasps and certain types of flies. Uh, they, they, their mouth parts or their tongues are not super long. They can't go into deep flowers as much. A lot of those parasit parasitoid animals and predators uh, do like the smaller flowers. And a lot of those species that Robin, especially uh, alyssum, uh, dill, some of those types of flowers, things in the carrot family there's always exceptions with carrot family. There's some plants we do not want to have in our property, like wild parsnip. Um, carrot family tends to be kind of a friendly plant to some of those insects. I will, um, there's a lot we can add on there too. Cover crop wise, uh, Troy mentioned a few of these uh, this week. Buckwheat is a great summer uh, cover crop that can offer really good uh, floral resources to these animals. Uh, Lacey facilia, which is my favorite. That is kind of a alternative to buckwheat. Uh, there are pros and advantages with using that and there's some cons to using it in comparison to buckwheat. That's kind of a big, a bee's friend is uh, Seed Savers Exchange, common name for Lacey facilia. They have bee's friend. Um, that's something I really enjoy. And Claire, do you have any other recommendations for that? I think you guys have hit on a lot of plants. <laughs> so I think yeah, yeah. that's yeah. where that, that's a whole presentation right there. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, and the other thing is because I think in the in the chats or, or in the question and answer, people were talking about the lace wings or praying mantises and those beneficials that you can bring in and release in your yard. But remember, mm -hmm. if you're releasing in, them in your garden, they're only going to stay for as long as there's a food source. And once that food source has gone away, they're going to go away as well. The food source being other insects and pests that they're eating. So um, it's a lot harder to keep them in your garden than it is to keep in a structure. We have high tunnels and a greenhouse and we can release them and they'll stay in there for most of the season because they have a nice hab uh, habitat for them to live in. So it's not as easy to be purchasing and releasing those beneficial insects in your garden out in the open. Yeah. And there are and, other things yeah. like birds that eat the beneficial insects as mm -hmm. well. And beneficial insects are one tool in our toolbox. Um, they're, not, they're not something that's gonna control all pest issues all the time. So it's very important to use some of those pest or those insect ID skills, figure out what animals are causing you issues, look at maybe some natural enemies. Unfortunately, there's some insects that are just not gonna have a lot of uh, natural enemies or predators. Uh, in some things, times we have to live with that. So Japanese beetle right now in this area, in our part of Minnesota, well, there's not a lot of natural enemies for those guys yet. Um, so um, they do have natural enemies in their home ranges, uh, but here not quite. So uh, don't be discouraged if uh, you, know, you plant some of these uh, habitat, you bring in pollinators, you bring in this beneficial insects it's not gonna be a panacea. It's not gonna cure everything. So just, it's nature. Those animals are hungry. They need to overwinter. Sometimes if you don't have enough pests in your yard, they're not gonna stick around. Uh, you know, <laughs> especially those predators that may 
the floor resources are kind of secondary. So I'd like Jane, to touch really on this. Oh, go ahead, Claire, please. I was going to move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say more about this, Trey, go no, ahead. Okay. Nope, go ahead, Claire. Okay, so I, I just wanted to touch on this um, person asking about a swarm of yellow bugs and uh, saying that their app said they were soldier beetles. Uh, so I just want to touch on this because even when you see a group of insects, that doesn't mean it's a swarm, right? Like a swarm is kind of a specific thing um, with insects that either have a social phase or are social where they communicate with one another to be in a certain place for a certain reason. So you may have seen a big group of what probably was soldier beetles, really, if you saw yellow bugs, especially if they were on like sunflower or goldenrod or something like <laughs> Golden <laughs> that, yeah. Um, yeah. then yes, it probably was a group of soldier bugs. But I just wanted to say that swarm is a pretty specific behavior. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I was I was going to touch on red lily beetle. This uh, Karen asked how to treat red lily beetles. And as far as I know, they're, so they're relatively new insect pest in Minnesota. And so I think they are still being tracked by Minnesota Department of Ag. So if you do see them and they're not already known to be in your county, please do report them to the arrest the pest. Uh, hotline, which we can maybe, well, we can yep. maybe send that out in our resources. Yep. Um, but yep, so the red lily leaf beetle, uh, it's a bright red beetle. It has a kind of weird, uh, squishy looking larva and its um, eggs are kind of long and reddish as well. And so you can, if you have a small number of them or a small number of lilies, you can hand pick them and crush them. That's one way to control them after you report them, <laughs> I would say, uh, especially if they're not known to be in your area. And then there are a number of insecticides that would be effective against them as well. And I just wanted to add on to Diane's question about the um, soldier beetles. If it's the goldenrod kind of soldier beetle, the yellow yep. colored ones, those are uh, usually beneficial for the plant. It's not going to hurt the plant. They do feed on pollen, but I don't I, I, they really are not an issue for most oh, of those no. plants and yeah. they're actually beneficial because I think they occasionally might munch on something that is could be yes. a pest on it so they're kind of they're my they're kind of a really interesting insect because I see them as like the laziest I don't know I just get this like lazy vibe from those guys they just hang around and barely move on the goldenrod and but they are an know. incidental pollinator yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they accidentally pollinate things and <laughs> you'll see that a lot with insects you know not unlike that beetle I got caught 99 million years ago. It like it doesn't know what it's doing. It's just living its best life and it's pollinating at it while it's doing it. So well, I really appreciate uh, both Claire and Shane's uh, uh, information here today, myself included. Uh, I learned a lot in this process. And I am very grateful that they take such a sincere interest in trying to uh, um, educate us about this in such a fun manner. Uh, in addition to that, we hope that you will be able to join us tomorrow at the same time on how to not kill your tree. This will be a great topic for many folks uh, as we've got a lot of issues going on with trees uh, uh, throughout the state of Minnesota and, and elsewhere. So with that, we really appreciate your time and hope that you enjoyed our session today. You've recruited bug lovers. Hey, let's, let's, I that's the so. one thing. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a professor, Claire knows the exact professor, but the one professor that said something is, you know, if you can imagine a living creature doing something physically, an insect has probably figured out a way to do it. And that's really held true. Um, I'm always surprised. And Claire and I get surprised all the time. We like the grasshoppers, the locusts, and the differences like that. Just is like a Tuesday, you know. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> this is your uh, uh, 